this whole video is super raw and it's super honest and I think that's why I'm like I made sure I made notes and like I'm I'm trying to talk to you guys super fluid like I normally do but I also am a little nervous but it's it's because that this is out of all of the videos I've ever made I think this is the most pulling back the veil one for starters and two it's just the damn truth Welcome back to another coffee talk for today. I wanted to talk about a little skeleton, or yeah, I guess that makes sense, a little skeleton that I've had in my closet for a little while now. I'm not gonna lie, I'm not like nervous to film today's video. I'm just really stepping outside of my comfort zone today and I'm gonna try really hard not to just kind of like spin out and just like go off on so many tangents. I've written down the points that I wanna say. I want to make sure that I just like I hit on everything properly only because one, I know that what I'm going to talk about today is not only a sensitive topic for most, but it's not necessarily a sensitive topic for myself, but it's one that I want to make sure that I explain thoroughly, you know? So I've touched on said skeleton in my closet a time or two before with you guys, but I've never really dove deep into this topic. The main reason why is because, you know the quote, seek first to understand before being understood? That's pretty much been my main focus as of the last, I would say, like year and a half, going on two years almost, is to kind of understand this skeleton before I asked anyone else to, you know, understand it for me. And the reason why is because, well, one, I feel like, you know, before you can turn around and talk about something and like what you've learned about something, you have to first learn the lesson. And so I think I was still always kind of learning the lesson, still am in some ways, but I wanted to make sure that I had first fully understood what I had gone through before I turned around and shared my story. And that also stems too from the fact that I really wanted to share this story from a place of strength rather than a place of shame. I also wanted to wait until I could speak about this from a place of full authenticity and integrity because I also know that other times that I have talked about similar subjects before, I was still somewhat struggling with some of the outer aspects of what was kind of going on and I was still, I think, kind of going through the motions and trying to figure it out for myself and so I really wanted to make sure I was in a good, strong place before I cracked open this can of worms. It took me a really long time to detach myself from these old patterns and these old behaviors hence why I'm choosing today to talk about them and if you're curious exactly what it is that I'm talking about well I am talking about pretty much exactly that the actual skeleton in my closet the skeleton being me and my body and overall I would like to call it more than anything just an overpowering sense of body shame and on top of that body shame the dark and disorderly habits that started to become a a result because of my body shame. So let's start with the first part. How do I think I even kind of got to that point or how did it all happen? Okay, like where did it all start? So growing up, okay, it's normal to, I think, especially during your years of puberty and such, to go through phases where I think that you kind of feel uncomfortable in your own skin. It's also totally normal to grow up around people who are very human. And I think that I've learned through this experience that even sometimes the most heroic of people or the best of people also deal with their own sense of body shame and so sometimes even the people that are our leaders and the people that we look up to can be people that also struggle with their own sense of you know whatever it is we all we all have skeletons in our closet right and so I guess in a lot of ways when I was growing up it wasn't like a normal conversation at the dinner table to talk about body positivity and I don't think it was like something that we just like off and didn't talk about it at all. I just think it was just one of those topics that was never really one that we discussed and also too like I grew up not in relatively super close with my mom or my female role model right so I think that that also kind of fed into the fact that when I did start it 
to struggle with body image issues and when I did start to struggle with just properly taking care of myself I didn't really have like a motherly person to kind of help me guide through those things or guide those seas or navigate through what that all meant to me and so it was totally normal like it's one of those things that I think for a long time in my life I used to kind of blame that reason and like be very resentful towards that reason but I don't feel that way anymore just because I think that that's actually super super normal talking about body image in particular is really hard especially if you yourself don't feel that sense of body positivity so it can be really hard to then you know expect your parents or your guardians or your role models to teach you how to feel positive about your body and how to feel confident in who you are and show up in your body if they're also struggling with those things and that's what's so crazy is that when we do grow up you do realize that everybody really is just human and so I don't feel that sense of resentment anymore but I definitely didn't grow up in a environment that talked a lot about body positivity and I think that I was introduced to a little bit of some unhealthy habits and ways of coping with stress, ways of coping with self-consciousness and things that I maybe picked up on without even fully realizing it that would then affect me or I would then tend to repeat that pattern later on in my own life. Not to mention in my family, uh, weight was often a topic that was brought up. Weight was something that was definitely not necessarily focused on, but it was one that I remember hearing often more than not. And not just from my immediate family, but from extended family as well. It was always kind of a subject of discussion. It was just like weight was a thing. Like I do remember at a very young age weighing myself and I don't know why or how that even came to be, but I just, I remember weight being something that like I can remember talking about, hearing about, and also inquiring about within myself from the early ages of like grade two. And I mean, when you pile that in with also just observing natural behaviors of overindulging for comforts and also like hyper restriction, I think that my brain subliminally, subliminally, subliminally picked up on some of those things and attached to some of those things as being kind of like a norm, like a way of coping, a way of dealing, a way of eating. And that was just the way that you eat. That was the way that you know, your relationship to food should be because I, it's not that I wasn't necessarily taught any different. I think I was just kind of observing what was going on around me all the time. And that was one thing that I definitely observed. So as I got a little bit older and I remember like towards the later years of elementary school and definitely throughout high school, I started to seek out food as a sense of comfort for my own ongoing anxiety and my own ongoing feelings of just like stress and lack of control or other emotional things going on in my life then you know skip forward to the time that it was basically becoming my responsibility to make my own lunches my responsibility to start taking care of myself pretty much around the time that I hit puberty you best believe I didn't fully follow through on that so I started to ingrain an unintentional habit of pretty much starving myself all day I would go to school and just like not pack a lunch again specifically in high school and then get home and be so hungry and so exhausted from being at school that I would just like binge eat a bunch of food in my cabinet before it was even dinner time and then yes my mom would come home and make dinner and then I would eat that dinner as well so these habits were things that in my mind I didn't realize I was ingraining these behaviors but when you do something enough and you repeat it enough and it goes over and over and over again that's cycle does become a habit and that habit becomes you know part of who you are and so it became kind of norm or natural for me to just like wake up and like maybe have breakfast maybe not have breakfast go to school without a lunch I remember my other friend she was also kind of the same way like we're we were both just kind of lazy we just didn't make our lunches and so we would always kind of like scavenge off of our friends sometimes which like thinking back now I'm like damn I was that person and uh get home and then we would make like craft dinner peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and eat like a rack of oreos and then have dinner and that was just like a total norm for me and also like a sense of comfort for me so there's a lot of different things that i think i picked up at a young age but that doesn't only constitute for the reason why i started to struggle a lot later on in my life 
So fast forward into high school and after high school and I think another thing that kind of fed into how like my pattern with all of this kind of began was also just the societal norm of what was considered to be beautiful, what was considered to be attractive, what was considered to be sexy. And so I started to look at things like Victoria's Secret Angels and I started to see these like actresses and these models and I would like Google what their diets were and I would always be so like intrigued. Like how did they stay so slim? How did they look like that? Like their limbs were just so long and so like thin. And I remember I started to basically romanticize and like idealize a body type that wasn't naturally my own and also too was one that wasn't healthy for me like it wasn't like I was idealizing the body type because of the glow or the healthiness of this it was more so kind of like a physical representation of what that would mean to be admired you know if you look like this you will be loved if you look like this you will be accepted by the norm or by the like masses and things like that and so like I said these are all like subconscious things it's not like I consciously knew I was doing this none of us I don't think naturally do but and and again I also want to like hit home that I'm not like blaming these reasons for why they all started it it all does boil down to my responsibility for sure but I think that there are so so many people including myself that I know will watch either this video or have watched maybe other videos of other girls or other guys talking about these things and realize that it's just like such a, a norm it's a norm for all of us I think that we all at one point or another get self-conscious about something and to be self-conscious about our bodies I think is something that is actually way more norm um, than we think and I think that a lot of these things feed into it like when you're constantly being shown you know this is what it means to be sexy this is what it means to be beautiful you have to fit into this very very restricted narrow category in order to feel that way or to be that way then naturally you start giving your brain the task to make sure that you have to do what you got to do to be that way or at least that's kind of what I did so coming into high school, coming out of high school, I started to basically set a standard for myself that was very unnatural and very unhealthy and then constantly felt like a failure for not looking that way. Not to mention that we're definitely to the fact that there are girls that do naturally look that way, which no body shame whatsoever. It all just kind of fed into this really toxic pot inside of myself of just, you know, like not accepting the way that I was and not looking at my body as a means of health, as a means of well-being, but instead looking at it as a external factor in order to basically gain admiration and acceptance and ultimately to gain validation and love and that that was all it was good for, that that's what I needed to do, that I needed it to be a certain way. And so I started to also notice what some habits again of people around me were doing to stay that way to look that way and then I tried to start ingraining them into my own day to day. Now, I don't know if you are listening to this and you've never seen any of my other coffee talks or videos or anything like that ever before, or maybe you have. Feed into the fact that, like I said, there was a lot going on emotionally for me during all of these times too. I dealt with things like anxiety and depression on the background of this, but it also all kind of fed in. It was all interconnected. And so I guess in a lot of ways, forming these really unhealthy habits and trying to hyper control something that I felt I could was a way for me to deal with things and numb out feelings that I didn't want to feel anymore. It's incredibly interesting because I can look back on certain situations in my life now and I can see how there were times up until about my earlier 20s I can definitely say that I was chasing a feeling of love that I was holding out from on my own. Like it was like I was looking for someone to come in and love me the way that I couldn't love myself. And so for that reason, I stayed in relationships that I knew weren't going to last for too long. And I started to exhibit behaviors and I started to exhibit habits that I knew were very toxic, like binge eating and counting calories, being super restrictive and super regimented and just way too hard on myself and putting all of this pressure on myself and over exercising and doing these things because I felt like that would actually lead somehow to me feeling that sense of fulfillment and love. Like if I could just, you know, empty myself out enough or work myself out enough or just stay with someone long enough or look a certain way that I would finally feel that sense of love and validation and self-acceptance 
on the outside. And it turned into this like vicious cycle of binge eating and then self-loathing and then depression, which led to numbing out and not eating. And it was just a super vicious cycle that I would go through over and over and over again, sometimes through periods of weeks, sometimes through periods of months, and sometimes even through the period of like a year. The reason why I'm not using the words like you know, eating disorder or getting specific about, you know, what terminology I want to use for this is because that's one of the things I wanted to be very careful about today because not that I would necessarily say there's no credit behind that. I just think for me and through the therapy that I, I've done, which I'll touch on in just a moment, but I think that I've discovered that it isn't necessarily about just the eating. It was never really about just the eating or the not eating for me. And all of that, all of that was very disorderly and it was very unhealthy and unbalanced and unwell. But the reason why I'm talking about it more so from a standpoint of like, first of all, this being a skeleton in my closet is because for one, there's like five people in my entire life that I've ever talked about this to. And uh, that's why it's kind of like, you know, skeleton in the closet, except now I'm talking to all of you about it. And uh, two, because like I said, I don't think it's just one particular zoned in focus. And I also think that I don't want to label it with anything because it was just ultimately a big pattern and a big experience that I learned from. And so I don't know, like I feel like for a long time too, even wanting to be careful knowing that when I was in these habits and I was stuck in these behaviors that I would seek out people that would talk about these things because somehow it would almost like re-motivate me to stay exactly where I was. And that's the other big thing that I want to be very, very careful of because like I said, like I've been there and I've done that and I know how unhealthy that gets and so you almost start to romanticize in your mind when you are going through those patterns and those behaviors, the idea of what it means to like have an eating disorder or the idea of what it means to you know go through these things like you kind of romanticize being a victim or like maybe you know feeling like if you go through this it becomes like your friend and so I totally understand that and I totally get that and I've totally been there and if you get that or been there or, you know it like relate to that in any kind of way then I really really urge you to listen to all of this all the way through because I've outsourced and outsought things that I thought would keep me right where I was, that would keep me two hands tightly gripped on that control. And the more I tried to control it, the more I tried to basically feed my hunger, the hungrier I got and the more unhappy I got and the more unsatisfied and lack of love that I felt and lack of value that I felt. And it got to a point where, and we'll get to all of this, I'm starting to spin off already. I almost had to be so so tired of the cycle, so tired of going through it over and over and over again. And I also just got so, so damn tired of like loathing myself, of just feeling like I had to prove something to myself and could only validate myself in a 3D external way, that I didn't have any kind of self-value or that I didn't have any reason to basically accept and love and take care of myself for whatever reason of feeling inadequate, of feeling unworthy, all of that. So that all fed into this and that's why, you know, I'm using the terminology skeleton in my closet because I don't know, it just feels like the easiest way to, for me to kind of branch or umbrella everything that I want to talk about. So chapter two of this story is how it all formed and how it actually affected my life. So as I mentioned, the binge eating came first and that is one that it came first, but I accepted this behavior last, funny enough. The binge eating started early in school. It started solely based on the fact that I was just a lazy kid that didn't make her lunch. It wasn't like I was intending to do that. I mean, at first I wasn't, but I was just, I would just get lazy. I'd go to bed, I'd wake up, and I'd be like, I don't feel like making a lunch, I'm not hungry right now, and then I'd get to school and I'd be like, damn, I'm freaking hungry. So then by the time I got home, I would be so hungry and so ravenous that I would just like eat a bunch of stuff in my fridge because I didn't have that balance or that routine for my body to know that food was coming. So it would just be like, eat, 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 eat. And I would eat a lot, and then I'd be like so full that I'd feel sick, wait an hour or two, and then I'd eat dinner with my family. And that was just like this habit that I started to form so unknowingly 
and at such an early age that started to affect me a lot more later on in life and I say it was the last one that I accepted because this is the one that I think I had the most shame around like I said I think it's very easy to kind of romanticize the idea of not eating but nobody wants to romanticize the idea of overeating and most of the time for myself whenever I was going through these patterns of not eating it always got topped back with overeating so much food afterwards because I was putting my body through so much deprivation and it would always result in just having to eat just like so much food to either gain a sense of comfort or because I was just so lacking in so many different things. So that was definitely the first habit that started, the first thing that formed and one that affected my life in a lot of ways. Now, how the restrictive side of this formed. I think the first time that I ever really dropped a lot of weight was right after the, like, pretty much around the time that my parents had split up. It was right around the end of grade 12. Um, I decided to go away to college and that was like my way of dealing with it or actually let me rephrase that. That was my way of taking myself out of a very stressful and traumatic situation. I was just like, screw it. I'm going to go away to school. It was a very impulsive decision. I followed that decision and then while I was away at school, I dropped a lot of weight. Again, it started out unintentional. I went away to school and I was like, for the first time I had my own freedom and for the first time I could cook what I want. I could go and work out at the gym that I had a membership to for free through my school like course. And so I started going to the gym. I started eating healthy. By this point I was already vegan for my own like sense of moral value. I definitely went into it thinking like, I just want to get super healthy. But then, you know, you start getting healthy and this is the first time I really had experienced my own sense of self-discipline and actually sticking with routines and such. And so I really started to fall in love with that aspect of it. But then as I started to, you know, when you do, you go from not eating healthy at all to like eating pretty damn healthy and working out, your body does start to change. But then this really unhealthy thing kind of kicked in where I started to feel like that feeling I always wanted in high school where it was like, oh, my body's changing and I like it. And so I started to slowly but surely shrink the amount of food I was eating, but increase the amount of exercise that I was doing within these routines. And that's when I think it first started for me how unhealthy these behaviors could become or that I started to experience it without really like acknowledging it because I didn't want to. All along I've always known, even from the first experience, that something was wrong about it. Like something always kind of felt off about it and I think it's because all of us know when we're doing something wrong on some level. You know, I think we all know deep, deep down when something is actually sitting right at our core and when something isn't. And I just became so, and I say this with all love for myself, but at the time I was very shallow and at the time I was being very vain and I started to, again, like I said, feel like, oh, like people are starting to notice. People are starting to congratulate me on the weight that I'm losing. People are starting to pay attention to me. And that became kind of like this feeling that I really enjoyed. I'd never felt that way before, at least in my own mind, I hadn't felt that way before in that kind of way. And so, I had dropped a lot of weight and then I moved back home from college and uh, moved back into a very like toxic environment which only kind of continued to feed into this obsession with now wanting to control everything. It became this only thing that I could control at that age and at that time in my life and with all of the external validation I was now getting, it just became, again, like I said, a very vicious cycle. It was like stressful situation outside of my control. What can I control? This. I'm going to control this. People start noticing outside validation. Ooh, I feel good about that now. And then it only can go on for so long before, like I said, my body would be just so deprived and I'd get so hungry that I would lapse and I would just binge eat a bunch of food and then thus became the super ingrained cycle of you know, restrict, binge, self-loathe, like I already said. I'm really sorry if this is going all over the place, guys. Like I said, this is like a new, this is, it's hard because I've like, see, I can't even get my words out. I've only really talked about this with like five people. So this is just like a level of intimacy that we are getting on right now. But I'm, I think it's important. And the reason why I want to talk about it today in particular is because for one, this is important for me to close this chapter in my life, but also two, because there are so many girls, like I said, out there that I have found and that I've related to that actually helped me 
notice these things within myself and heal these things within myself. And so if this story can relate to anyone out there, not only does it shut the chapter for me, but it might also open up the chapter of healing for someone else, or even just make somebody that's already gone through this and healed themselves know that they're not alone, that none of us are. A lot of us deal with this and it's totally normal. Anyways, like I said, I basically attached myself to the feelings of, well, for, for one, the not feeling, because not only that, the more that I didn't eat, the more that I was able to numb out, like numb out this feeling. And I was dealing with depression at the time too, so that was a good feeling for me at the time, or at least it felt that way. And I basically attached to this like torment of what it felt like. Like it was almost like the more sad I got, the more like sadistically good I felt, but not in a good way. It wasn't actually that I felt good. It was that I was almost kind of like thriving off of the idea of loathing myself. Like as sad as that is, that's the honest to God truth that I was just like, yeah, like you don't deserve to feel like blah, 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 blah right? And these were like the ongoing mixtapes going on inside my mind and thoughts and patterns that I were creating and was creating at the time without knowing it, thinking that, oh, this will just get me close enough to my goal weight and then I'll go back to trying to be healthier. Or, you know, this is just a way for me to deal with this thing going on in my life. But once I'm happy, I'll stop doing this. And that's what I would always kind of justify inside my mind. I was like, it's just because I'm sad right now. When I'm happy, I'll be fine. But like, realistically, and I think that we all kind of know this now, it's become more of a societal norm the more that mental health is talked about and the more that we all, I think even just within the coffee talks and all that, I think we all know that happiness is not a freaking destination. It's a part of the journey. And even when you're going through hard things, it doesn't mean you can't also have happy moments. So I had just created this very obscured version of what life felt like to me or what life was supposed to be like and thought that like, oh, I'm just going through this, so this is how I'm coping, this is how I'm dealing. And in a lot of ways, it's like if you've gone through this and you did feel shame, like I felt a lot of shame when I did eventually accept that this is a part of who I am and a part of my history. The reason why it took me so long to accept it is because I was so embarrassed that I went through this. Like in my eyes, I was like, oh, this experience in my life makes me weak and it makes me vulnerable and it makes it makes it so that I'm flawed, but then the older I've gotten, the more I've realized we're all flawed and it doesn't make you weak to go through these things. In a lot of ways, there's a lot worse things you could have done or I could have done to have coped with the things going on in my life, but instead this is what I chose and I don't actively choose to feel shame about it anymore because I think that for one, everything happens for a reason and I think that this whole experience taught me a lot but also too, because like I said, we're all flawed. We all go through things for whatever reason, who, who knows really at the end of the day, but I think that when we do go through these things, they end up making us stronger on the other side. So after college and that being the first time that that cycle kind of played out, I spent the following few years pretty much trying to keep a tight, tight ass grip on that whole sense of control in my life. and. That tight, tight grip led to basically that cycle having gone from such a big, long time period to getting shorter and shorter and shorter because, like I mentioned, when your body is in restriction, when your body is in starvation mode, it will constantly be sending cravings and triggers to your brain to eat, 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 eat. And willpower is, it's like, willpower is like a battery, right? You can only use it for so long before it gets depleted. But the more you use your battery, the faster it your battery life goes down. So it's like I was at the very beginning able to hold off for a very long time before finally giving in and binging. But then each time that I binge and go back, my battery life just kept getting shorter and shorter. And so I would restrict, 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 but then those little triggers of like, oh my god, I need to eat a bunch of food, like I don't know when I'm gonna get my next meal, or oh my god, we could die, we should probably eat. These are what your body is naturally gonna say to you because your body wants you to be alive, your body wants you to have energy, your body wants you to live and thrive. And so the more that I kept on 
muting that voice, the louder it got. And the louder it got and the shorter my battery life got, the faster I gave in to these habits of binging, which meant that that cycle got shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter until it started to feel like I was literally going crazy. And not only that, the tighter I tried to grip onto that control, the more creative I had to get. Because like I said, willpower only got me so far. So I started trying things like supplements that were super unhealthy for my body. And I tried to do all of these different diets and all of these different things that I thought would keep me right where I was. And the worst part is, is that even when I wasn't like, you know, thin, like too thin, I was still feeling the same amount of shame and the same amount of self-loathing as I was when it was physically apparent. And I think that that is also a thing that has made me hold back for so long about talking about this is because I always felt like I wasn't like, like, and I, I mean this with the most respect, but I felt like I wasn't like sick enough. Like I felt like, well, I'm not being hospitalized, so I should be okay. It's not physically apparent because during those phases where I wasn't necessarily too small or too thin, or at least physically, it didn't look like I was too unhealthy. Mentally, I was so unhealthy. And my relationship to food and my relationship to my body and my relationship to myself was so unhealthy, but it wasn't a physical thing that you could see. There might be so many people going through this and you don't even know it because it might not be physically apparent. Even during those phases after going through periods of binging and I would gain my weight back if not more, it wasn't obvious that that was kind of what was going on. And so I felt like it was almost kind of worse during those times. It was almost like, it was like I was a failure during those times. So the way that I was feeling was even worse and the loathing and like the hating my body and hating myself and beating myself down and thinking like, oh my God, like I have no willpower. I have no whatever. Like obviously all these girls can do this or all of these people are able to do this. Why can't I? And it was because I wasn't being healthy. It wasn't like I was actually living a sustainable lifestyle. I was just constantly cycling through starving and then overeating and then starving and then overeating, which thus turned turned me into this person that just secretly obsessed over every, like everything that I ate and uh, also tracked everything, became super regimented in these super strict rules and tried to like, you know, fast and do all of these crazy things. And then my moods were all over the place and I was irrational and I was always just, not always, like I say this, like obviously looking back on these times, I say always, but I say that because it was, it did feel like a lot of the times I was going crazy. Like one little thing would happen and I would just get set off and I would be just such a cranky biatch because I was hungry and because my body was hungry and my hormone levels couldn't balance. My entire body chemistry was completely off because I wasn't balancing myself and what, the way I was living was so erratic and irrational that of course then I became erratic and irrational. I would either become like super, super strict or I would have zero value for my body and zero sense of self-worth that I just wouldn't really give a crap and I would just give up, let myself go, eat whatever I really wanted and just binge eat all the, until like I basically felt that sense of like comfort and that sense of, well, I mean, a lot of the times too, when I would binge eat back then, I would be binge eating like foods like simple carbs and like high fat and deep fried foods and all of these foods that would release these endorphins in my brain that would make me feel super happy, that would basically tell my brain, okay, you don't need to, we don't need to, you know, like continue to like eat anymore. Like we've gotten way more than our fill. And now let's store all of this food because we don't know when we're going to go back into starvation mode. And that is how it also became harder every time to lose the weight. So I think this is the part that I always kind of held off on talking about because it is definitely the most, um, I would say recent. So the worst that I ever got was April, around April, that kind of time of 2018, which is funny because that's also when I felt like that's the best, my, at least at the time it felt that way. It was like the, the most I felt like I was on par with keeping up with like my filming schedule, my work schedule, like my YouTube was on the rise, like all of these things were kind of going on and I was traveling and I was really kind of branching out of my comfort zone in life, but I still had this dirty little secret that was going on in the background. And it got definitely the worst around that time because I think for one, I was shedding a lot of layers. My life was in a very big transformational point, but also there was still a lot of things that I was 
unwilling to confront and unwilling to face. There were a lot of emotions that I had kept locked up inside of me for so long from such earlier times in my life that I just didn't want to have to deal with, but I knew and I could feel this sense of like, I'm about to go on a journey with this. And that scared me so much that again, I went right back to what I knew to be the one thing that I felt like I could control. And so if you guys remember, um, and it's still a beautiful memory for me because it was the first trip I ever took with Bentley and there were so many good memories on this trip and there was so much life learning and growth and expansion on this trip, but the trip where Bentley and I drove off to Florida and came back, that was probably right around the time that it was pretty close to being like the worst it had been. It wasn't just the fact that I was going through a breakup, which definitely fed into what was going on, but it was also too that this time around, I was kind of letting go of that security blanket again of somebody who I felt like was giving me the love I wouldn't give myself. But on top of breaking off that relationship, I was also dealing with things still going on in my home family, still going on with people that I really cared about and were really, really close to me back at home that I couldn't help because I wasn't there. Not only that, on top of all of that, I was in a brand new city. I was in, you know, I had just kind of moved to Toronto and jumped into a relationship because like I said, I, I tend to, I've noticed this behavior and so I've picked up that throughout my life times when things are really kind of like big changes going on, I latch on to something that makes me feel really safe. And so this was the first time I was really going to have to take on the city without having a significant other to kind of, you know, make me feel like I had a place. And I was just going through so much change. And so I was like, okay, this is something that isn't changing. This is something that, like I said, it became my, my good friend, my, my secret friend, but it wasn't a good friend. It was actually a very toxic, toxic friend. It's New Year's, let's go for some straight goals. I wanna eat whole foods, I wanna start working out, I wanna get on my running routine, I want to X eating any kind of like takeout foods because when I was first living here, I would like get Uber Eats almost every single day and I was just like, no more of that. And so again, it started off with the healthiest of intentions. But then as my body started to change again, I noticed myself again, basically falling back in love with this super toxic friend for different reasons this time. It almost became like I fell in love with my sadness and I fell in love with the feeling of shrinking myself away because this was the time, like the first time that I really had to face my own sense of self value. And that was a big hurdle for me to have to face one, just for the first real time, but also two, to feel like I was facing it alone. Because like I said, I wasn't talking to anyone about these things aside from, I mean, if you guys have watched me long enough to know, I did talk about it with Greg at the time who was my boyfriend that I was breaking off with. And so I did talk about it with him and he did know towards the end of our relationship. And he was, a, he was someone that was actually very supportive at the time and wanted to try and help, but didn't really know how. And right as our relationship was crumbling apart, I openly was just like, you know what, this is a big part of why. And it's because I don't value myself. It's because I, I don't feel like I'm worthy and I have these unhealthy behaviors that are starting to show up again. And they're showing up again, but they've been in my life before and I really need to focus on them and I really need to hammer these out. And so I, I guess for like the first time started to actually accept that perhaps I had a problem, perhaps that I was doing something that wasn't very healthy for me. It wasn't until it got really bad that I actually really started to face it. Like at one point I had, I was getting really, really bad like dizzy spells. I was getting really bad like black visions or black like spots in my vision. Um, I had to go for blood work at one point and like I said with the feeling like you're going crazy, I was going off to Florida and when I drove to Florida, I drove almost straight through and the first night I stopped, it was in Carolina, um, North Carolina. And I remember I was in the Airbnb and I remember thinking that someone was trying to break into this Airbnb and nobody was. Like I actually, you start to like actually think you're going crazy. That's at least my experience is that my brain was so deprived that it was just like constantly on edge constantly anxious and and just started to just like I started having these very almost kind of there's an actual term for it catastrophic beliefs or catastrophic 
like anxieties of things that were going on that weren't actually happening but I was believing them because it felt so real to me because my brain was in constant fight or flight mode. I started having really bad digestive issues because the more you restrict what you're eating the more your body will start to adapt. It'll try to, it will try to adapt. It'll try to get accustomed to the way that you're eating. And so I would only eat like three or four different types of foods. And then so if I only eat those three or four different types of foods for like a few weeks, but then went on a binge or started introducing new foods to my body, it didn't know what to do with them. It was like, what is this? And so I would get so bloated and I would get so like uncomfortable that again, a new pattern just continued to just continue. It got, I think, worst of the worst when I started to feel like I was having panic attacks almost every day. I felt like I was shriveling away and people started to notice, but not in a way that was validating. It was no longer like, you seem healthy, how are you losing this weight? It was like, you seem unhealthy, are you okay? And if there's one thing that I think, I have like one massive pet peeve for some reason, I've had it since long before any of this ever existed, and it's the feeling of someone being like, are you okay? Because I'm like, yeah, damn, I'm okay. And so I'd kind of get defensive and I would defend this secret toxic friend that I had and uh, just withdraw away from everybody so that they couldn't confront me about it. And then when it started to get bad enough that I was having heart palpitations and I was getting, you know, having to go in and get blood work done, I knew I didn't deal with it right away, but I knew it was something I was gonna have to deal with. So fast forward to that summer, there was some like things that started to roll out in my life that really made me, like forced me in a lot of ways to kind of confront what was going on and so, I went away to BC, if you guys remember that road trip, it's a whole different road trip that I went on with Bentley. And I took Bentley out to the West Coast and we drove around for like two weeks, we went camping and it was actually when I was camping. It was on that camping trip, I think I've, again, if you've heard any of these stories before, you might know that I've told you that that camping trip, I had a lot of epiphanies. Well, this was one of them, one that I didn't really talk about, but one that definitely happened. And it was one where I just like, I had the most, I say beautiful, but it was a breakdown. It was a breakdown, but it was a beautiful breakdown in the sense that I finally just like, I, I guess I kind of like faced it for the first time and I finally accepted that I was gonna get help. I was not gonna do this by myself anymore because it was clear that I couldn't and I had lost the trust in myself and telling myself that I would. And so it was actually on that BC trip that I did the research and I found my therapist and I signed up for therapy. And I went into therapy not just because of this, but it was basically the final straw for me because I knew that I didn't want to keep going through this vicious cycle anymore. And I knew that what I was doing was just a surface level behavior to feelings that were probably way more deep rooted that I was finally like, okay, I'm going to put on my armor. I'm going to go to war. Let's face this. Let's finally just face what it is that I'm running from or what it is that I'm trying to starve. And uh, I took on therapy. Now I didn't talk about this with my therapist right away. It started with talking about my anxiety and my depression and then slowly I started to tell her about these behaviors and these habits that I had and we began to slowly unpack them. And then from summer of 2018 onward, up until even just like, even now my therapist and I still talk about these things, but we talk about them in a different way now because they, I think they affect me in a different way now, which we'll get to. Um, but I slowly started to also unpack the shame I had around it. And I think that that was the hardest thing for me to get around was that I finally realized through talking about it with somebody and through having that safe place to open up about this, it was like, I, I finally realized like, I'm really ashamed to admit that this is something I do because it's not something I believe in for anyone else. It would make me so sad if I knew that my best friends were doing to their bodies what I was doing to mine. But to me, I felt validated to do so. I really had to almost like pick at this scab until it, until it reopened the wound so that I could actually heal because I was very ashamed of it and I was not proud of the fact that this was a behavior that I had picked up. Just people that were dealing with these things all around the world and I knew that, you know, it didn't make me special to deal with this and then even that was something I had to deal with. It was just like there was so much emotion. Anyone that's dealt with it, everybody's emotion around it might be different and everybody's reason or root cause might be different, but there was so much to it. There was, I just, I felt overwhelmed. I didn't even know where to start, which was very Pisces of me. And uh, slowly my therapist and I unpacked it and we unraveled it and I slowly began to accept it about myself so that I could learn from it. I went through my stages of feeling very angry at myself for it, 
but eventually I did start to heal that wound. And now I'm back in a healthy weight. I'm back to feeling like I can trust myself to eat intuitively, to know when I'm hungry, to never starve myself ever again, and to exercise in a way that's about, you know, valuing my body. Basically what therapy did for me is it helped me finally make that connection that I always knew was there. I always knew it was there, but it was hard for me to make it because it was all going on inside my head. Like I said, it was a skeleton in my closet. It was a secret friend I had. I didn't have really like a way for me to make these connections until I started talking about it. And so finally, through therapy, I was able to understand that what I was doing didn't actually resonate with what I believed to be true in my core about wellness and about health and about, you know, just valuing yourself and what I believed to be true for other people. I finally had to start ingraining into being true about myself. And for the first time, I think I finally started to like accept that I was flawed and that I needed help and that that was totally okay. So chapter three, what did I do about it? So like I already mentioned, uh, the first thing I did was I, I got a therapist and the more that I started to talk about it, the less it felt like this dirty secret I was holding inside. I was no longer only accountable to myself. All of those times that I said I went through that cycle, there were definitely times that I was like, okay, you know what, no more, I'm gonna get healthy now, I can do this by myself, I'm not gonna be this way anymore, but I would always fall back into the similar behaviors. It was like the minute something would throw me off course or something bad would happen in my personal life or I was dealing with an emotion that felt too overwhelming for me, I would give back into the same, I say addictive behaviors, because it did feel that way to me at the time. You know, the next therapy session, she's gonna be asking for an update. And so that really helped me become accountable to someone other than myself, which also showed me that I could be accountable to myself too. Not to mention that going to therapy really helped me find the root cause of these behaviors. These were all surface level things that I was doing. And I say surface level in the sense of like, they were like quick band-aid fixes to things that I just didn't wanna face and what experiences in my life led me to feeling like I wasn't worthy, that I wasn't good enough, that I had to prove something, that I was only worth what I was externally, and so I really had to like basically get down to that root. She was life coaching me back to myself, and I was finally willing to actually believe that I could get there, and that I was, not only that I could get there, I think I always knew I could, but I was finally willing to believe that I deserved to be there, that we all did, not just everybody else, but also myself. And that was like, I think the biggest hurdle that I had to get over. Where in my environment I picked up on certain habits, certain behaviors so that I could untangle them for myself. And also too, I think one of the biggest, most underrated things when I was writing my points down for how therapy helped me is it helped me so much with my irrational fear that if I were to start eating regularly and healthily again, that I would lose control, which is so crazy to me now because in a lot of ways, the way I was going through eating and my relationship to food before was the epitome of losing control. It was like I would control, 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 and then explode and have zero control. And I had it ingrained in my head that if I were to eat regularly, that I had this irrational fear I was going to just gain a ton of weight. But the only thing that was actually making me gain weight that I didn't need was from all of the unhealthy binges. If my body is actually sustained and fulfilled, then it isn't going to be sending those triggers to my brain anymore to eat, 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 eat. It's going to say, thank you for that. Here's some energy in return. And here's a you know non-foggy mind and some more stable behaviors, some more stable emotions. And you know, here's a nice glow. Here's some prettier hair. Here's some nicer nails. Like some, some things that you just don't even think of. It's like she helped me uncover within myself my intuition, my inner sense of guidance again, my inner voice, my inner sense of trust where it was like, oh, I'm hungry, but I'm actually hungry. Like I'm not, I, my body is actually asking for food and it's asking for healthy food. Let's give it that. And to start trusting those feelings again, because I had basically told myself that hunger was wrong and that hunger was flawed and that hunger was, you know, lack of willpower. Number two, I brought it back down to the basics. Like I said, the minute that I started to face all of this, the minute that I was able to then take a really good look at what my goals and my intentions were. Even when my intentions were good, 
my like goals, like my goal weight and like all of these goals I was setting out for myself and goals that I had surrounded myself with, like body types that were just not natural for me and things that I thought like, you know, it's my goal to only eat this amount of food today. It's my goal to just not eat fat. It is my goal to over exercise or to work out this many days a week and like throw my knee out and like do all these things that were not actual healthy goals that aligned with my intentions. And so bringing it back to the basics, it was like, what is my actual goal? My goal is to glow. My goal is to be healthy. My goal is to be well, to have an overall sense of wellness within my lifestyle and to live in a way that I didn't have to be so constricted and to instead be free. My goal was, that is exactly what it was. It was to find freedom in life again and to find trust in my intuition and to feel like I was just a functioning normal human being that didn't obsess over food and my body and all of that. I was so sick of feeling weak and giving up on plans that were monumental memories with people to just stay home because I was too tired or I was afraid of going out and overeating or having food that I had nixed off my list of things I was allowed to have. And, you know, I just stopped. I, I, my, my goals became, I no longer want fear to navigate my life. And when you're saying I no longer want, want fear, you can't get rid of something without replacing it with something else. So I brought it right back down to the actual basics. You know, what does a natural human being, when you take who the person is outside of it, what does our bodies naturally need on a basic fundamental level. We need to fuel, we need to move, we need to rest, and then we need to repeat. The more I started to actually fuel, move, and rest my body in a, in a healthy, balanced way, it started to decrease the pressure I felt of fear and anxiety, like overwhelming fear and anxiety I had of eating in front of people. Like it was just like all of these fears that became irrational started to grow back into rational, normal behaviors. Basically bringing it back down to the basics of what it means to be an energetic person, to be a free person, to be a glowing individual, to have so much energy that you have it not only for yourself, but can actually then give it out to the world because that's all I ever really truly wanted to do. It's just that I was dealing with so much emotional baggage that I wouldn't face that I was constantly depleting my energy and then trying to also give out my energy through my like my online platforms and like my things that I felt like I, I had this purpose. I've, I came to earth with the purpose we all did. And from a young age, I was always very ambitious about my purpose and driven towards my purpose. But the thing is, you can't be driven towards your purpose if you don't have any gas in your tank. And I was basically trying to floor it to my purpose in my car, being my body, without gas at all. Like I was like, nope, my car is not allowed to have gas, but I expect it to get me there and I expect it to get me there and have a damn good ride. How can that, like that is so irrational. Instead, I started to look up to different role models, not for the way that they looked, but for the like life that they breathed, you know, the energy that seemed to be actually radiating from them. And I was like, I want to be one of those people. And I value that they see, you know, intrinsic value in themselves. And I value that they eat so healthy and in such a way that doesn't like I could tell this person wasn't obsessing over the fact that they just had a piece of cake because they don't they don't binge on cake. They just have a piece when the offer is there, like once in a blue moon, you know, it was just that sense of bringing it back down to the basics, which meant bringing it to me back down to balance. I stopped looking at everything so incremental and I started looking at things instead with a term of what kind of results I wanted to get out of something and what kind of relationship to the experience I was having that I wanted to basically explore. I didn't want to live my life feeling like I was stuck in this foggy, gray, sad, heavy cloud and constantly observing myself and constantly analyzing myself because not only that, like I said, like I'm willing to fully admit, like it made me so vain. It made me so, I was just not, I didn't enjoy spending time in my own head. And then I think the third way that I dealt with, you know, all of this was I reestablished my own sense of self-worth. And I, this one took me the longest. And it wasn't until I was watching one of these like motivational videos where someone was literally talking about self-worth. And when she talked about how it was intrinsic. It was like, no matter who you are on this earth, because you are here and because you are alive and you are the evidential proof of life that you have intrinsic value because life has value. Because I think that we are all born with that. 
but I think that we unlearn it through society and through like just things that happen to us and everybody has shit that happens to them. So we all take our shit and we, we basically internalize it somehow. And so I had to basically unravel and untangle the way that I internalized my own crap growing up and my own beliefs that I picked up from society and from those around me. And I really had to take a like eraser to that whiteboard and then fill it in with healthier ideas of value and worth. It's like, honestly, I have no, I have nothing to hide anymore. And I am willing to admit that I struggled with all of these things and that it made me at times a very ugly person. And it was almost like going through these behaviors and then feeling myself start to care about things that I knew in my core I didn't care about. I really had to dig, dig deep for this one and open up the vulnerability with myself. And that's the only reason why I can now do it with other people is because I had to finally unlock that door and it was terrifying. And then once I did it, it was exhilarating. It was liberating and it was also nowhere near as scary as I thought it was gonna be. That there was nothing wrong with me and that there's nothing wrong with you if you're watching this and, and you relate to any of these things, that we're all just human. I finally stopped looking for outside validation for outside permission to love myself and to feel good about myself and to feel good about my body and to use my body in the way that it was meant. And I stopped looking for outside validation to love me. And I think that that was like the biggest one because I have so, like so much space and so much love and so much room in my heart for everyone I have ever loved. Like every relationship I've ever been in, what I've gone through up until now didn't discredit those relationships because they were all such mirrors. They were all such support systems. But I also know that a lot of the relationships I went in, I went into them with a sense of, I don't feel full. I feel like half of somebody and I need you to fill me in. And uh, I don't feel like I'm allowed to love myself. So I need you to show me how. And that I think is the biggest thing that I gained out of all of this. The way that I had spent and have spent years telling other people to love themselves and the way that I genuinely, genuinely like want people to love themselves, I finally started to love myself that way. And that was something that I didn't ever think I would ever come to a point that I would be able to do. And I think most importantly, and this is the one that gets me, I'm not gonna get all like sappy and cry about it, but because it's just the one that I felt I would never get rid of. I think the biggest thing that like reintroducing my sense of value and trust with myself again is that I finally cut away all of these deeply embedded, almost like laws and rules and regiments inside my mind of what I could and could not do. And instead I started to listen to my body. It was like I reconnected and re-nurtured that relationship. And so me and my body, even though we're the same thing, we also communicate differently now. And so I'm able to actually trust and listen to my body when it's time for rest and when it's time to eat and when it's time to work out and when it's time, like I was just, whenever my body gets that impulse now, I know that it's not coming from a place of self-sabotage or, you know, feeling inadequate. I know now that it's coming from a place of like holistic love. <laughs> and I know that that's corny, but it's the hardest one. I think not the hardest one, but it was the biggest one because I didn't think that there would ever be a time that I would look at something and not be able to just see it as calories or to look at something and not see it as something I'm not allowed to have or something that I am allowed to have or like green food, red food, yellow food on the in between, you know, like it was just all of these rules and these little, tricks and trap doors I made for myself to keep this control, I finally let go. And like when I finally let go, I was able to actually hear all of the things my body had been trying to tell me all along. Basically, I started to see my body for what it was, which is it's, it's an engine full of energy rather than my enemy. I stopped seeing it as somebody I was in conflict with and I started seeing it as someone I could hold hands and be, you know, in correlation with and align with because once I did that, 
that engine started to rev up again and I started to feel so alive again. And even though it meant I had to face feelings that weren't so great, it also meant that I was able to find the beauty first of all, in those feelings, but also feel the things that were amazing that I felt like were missing somehow. Those feelings I had when I was a kid, when I could like just feel so much love for a tree. I was like, why don't I feel that same love for trees anymore? And now I do. And it's like, I couldn't have one without the other. First of all, yin and yang balance, you know, but also too, it was like, I finally felt, I, I already said it. I finally felt alive again. I felt like I had energy and I finally felt like I had enough gas in the tank to take me to my destination, my purpose, my, my whole sense and reason I feel like I'm here. And in doing so, I feel like I've just begun a whole new journey. And this year was kind of like the ceiling of the fate, right? Because I started dealing with this really head on in 2018 and then 2019 was like really ingraining it into my life which is why this year felt so uncomfortable for me because it was so transformational and transitional but now it's like that version of me feels like a stranger and I feel like I, I just finally feel like myself again. The more I started to eat regularly and eat healthily the more I started to gain a bit of weight back and it just also, if you're watching this, I didn't gain like a crazy amount of weight back either. Like you guys have been watching me this whole time. I just gained my healthy weight back. And the more that that started to happen, the more the fog in my head started to clear. I started to see my body as the veil between who I am and how I interact with the world. And I started to, it's just that, it's just the portal in between, you know? My whole world opened back up. It's, this is gonna sound really corny, but you know how they say like when you're falling in love, you know, foods taste better, colors seem brighter and all of that stuff. In a really, really corny metaphoric way, I feel like I finally started to actually love myself and to actually embrace myself and open up all of these things within myself. So food really did start to taste better and colors really did start to shine brighter. And I felt like not only my life was glowing, but I started to feel my own sense of glow. And I mean, I think that it's even like kind of obvious if you can go back and, and just scroll through like, even just like watching my videos or my pictures or any of those things, like I've, I've seen it. Like I, I can see the light just slowly getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And I started to actually feel and, and physically see the difference it was making. Instead of feeding my fears, and starving myself. I started to starve my fears by feeding myself. What is the most latest update in terms of my timeline with this? I mean, first and foremost, I'm far enough on my journey that I was able to sit down and actually talk about this today and open up with it knowing that there's like, like I said, like five people that I've ever talked about this with in my life and now I know anyone that knows me, plus you guys will all now know these things if they, like if you watch this and you hear this. So that doesn't scare me anymore finding an actual balance and lifestyle that is sustainable for me and, and living out that lifestyle now. Now it's all just about like living living out my truth and that's kind of where I'm at. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, like I feel like I still have moments and triggers and that's totally normal because I think that too, if you do ever deal with something like this, it doesn't just automatically disappear, it doesn't just go away. I think that the longer, that the more we heal and that I think the longer time goes, time heals everything. But I think that there will always be little triggers for me and uh, it's like I'm aware of them and I think that not only that, the more aware I am of them, the more I, I acknowledge them when they happen and talk about them when they do, it stops them from really having control over me anymore, like having to go up a size in something or you know, when you're around, I think one of my biggest triggers is when I get around other people that I can, I can see they're stuck in their own behaviors and ways, which is none of my business at all. I'm aware of it, and now that I'm aware of it, I can just relax and I can just like let it pass. And, and like even just times and certain days that I'm bloated can feel like a trigger to me because I'm like, oh my god, like this is a very familiar feeling for me, but now I just am kind of like I just hold on to my big bloated belly and I'm like, hello, little belly. <laughs> like, and you know, this sounds so freaking weird, but it's because I just like I just have found new lighthearted ways to just embrace these like things that aren't comfortable. Like it's not like it's been sunshine and daisies healing all of this and I'm still affected by it in some ways. Like these little tiny things do definitely cast a big red flag and I'm like, oh, 
area that I'm 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 feeling something I'm feeling it in my bones this feels like a very easy trap door for me to fall back into some old behaviors and then once I do I can like hop skip jump over that trap door and continue on living my life knowing that I'm so much happier not even happier that I'm happy now another thing too because again I feel like this is something that is really big in our society today so I feel like it's also important if you're watching this and you have related to anything in today's video that the other thing that I think is so huge and is something that you can get to is uh, the other part is I don't look at pictures of myself anymore and like instantly just like break down like every single flaw and every single angle of myself every single just like critique I have on myself like it's like I just don't do that as much as I used to and it's again still not a comfortable thing for me there are still obvious everybody has unflattering angles and everybody has unflattering facial expressions and unflat everybody has an unflattering side you know but I don't see that anymore and think that that's all of me I'm just like mm, that's human and like I'm not I don't like paint myself in an entire color if I see a photo of myself that isn't the most attractive photo. I can laugh at it now. I vowed at the beginning of the year to no longer like tune, change, or whatever my body in any kind of way in my photos and I actually held strong. Like I did not change my body. I did not change my body shape in any photos in 2019. Even though I gained weight back going into 2019, you would think that would have made me want to change it more, but it actually just made me more sad to go back on photos where I was unhealthily thin and know that I also then edited my body on top of that. People, in my opinion, are most beautiful when they are happy. To me, happiness is being able to love yourself in, in a very, like not egotistical way, but just in, like I said, an intrinsic value kind of way. And also to have memories and build memories and have the energy to create those memories with different people. And happiness to me is feeling a sense of fulfillment from something that isn't on the external side of life. Not to mention, I think that genuine happiness for me also has turned into what it means to actually take care of myself and to find the joy, like the simple joy in the simple things in life, including taking care of myself, including like, meal prepping and like working out now in a way that I get to like see my performance or just use my energy up for the day or whatever it is rather than all the unhealthy ways I was doing it before. And all of this, all of these things are things that I am now able to do because my center, my main focus is no longer food and fear. It's, it's not like those were the, that was my paradigm for so long and my truth for so long and my secret for so long and I'm no longer controlled by food and fear. And so instead I have found freedom. And so there you guys have it. I know today's coffee talk was super long um, and super like raw and just we, just, we just really dug into some serious depth today. But it, like I said, it was the skeleton in my closet and it's one that I finally felt like I was ready to kind of air out and let out. And so if you related to this in any kind of way or knew or know of anyone that does, Feel free to write out your own story down below or pass this off to anyone that you think could maybe benefit from it in any kind of way. And, uh, and if you yourself are the person that did relate to this or are currently going through this right now, know that there is definitely a light on the other end of that tunnel and that you can trust yourself and that there's zero shame in what you're going through and that, you know, you have everything you need already within you. So I love you guys to the moon and back. Thank you for hanging out with me this long if you're still here. And I'll talk to all of you guys in the next coffee talk. Bye guys.